Well, good morning once again and again. Just welcome to church here at Faith Community Church. I'm so glad that you made it a priority to find a way to be in church this morning, and I, I'm honored that you would choose to do that with us here. Uh, the last few weeks, if you haven't been here, we've been going through John 15. We've been reading the first um, eight verses in John 15 and looking at what it teaches about this process of becoming like Christ. And if you've missed those sermons and you want to go back and listen, uh, thankfully you can. You can head to our website, www.woodstockfcc.com. Uh, click on the tab that's called Media, and from there you'll find uh, a plethora of ways to, to catch up on the messages, whether you want to listen to it as a podcast, directly from the website, or even find our YouTube channel from there to find the videos from previous services. Uh, but we've been going through John 15 and learning from it about what it teaches about this process of becoming Christ-like, of becoming like Christ. And essentially, uh, what we've learned is there are two things that it tells us that we have to do. The first, and this is clearly the large theme in the passage, is you have to get connected to Jesus. If you want to grow spiritually, if you want to bear fruit, as the passage talks about, if you want to look more like Jesus, you got to get connected to Jesus. And the best way to do that, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, is simply to spend time in the Word of God. Daily read your Bible. And I talk a lot more about that in, in the first sermon we did called Growing in Christ. Um, but I'll let you go there if you want to listen and learn more about that. Uh, but that's the first thing you have to do. Get connected to Jesus. If you want to grow spiritually, if you want to bear fruit, if you want to learn more about God and Jesus, you have to get connected to them and do that through reading the Bible. The second thing, though, that John 15 tells us, and this is really important, and we often uh, skip over this part, the second thing Jesus tells us, if you want to become Christ-like, is that you have to obey him. Uh, you have to submit to his process. You don't get to decide how to do this. You have to submit to the process that he lays out. So if you want to be Come Christ like you have to submit to the process. If you want that life that God has designed for you, if you want to become more like Jesus, like we're talking about, then you have to submit to the idea that your plans and your ideas are not the same always as God's plans and God's ideas. More than that, you have to submit to the concept that God's plans and ideas are better than yours, even if your plans and ideas disagree with his. So you're submitting, you're acting in humility and acknowledging that God's ways are above your ways. The, the uh, analogy that's used in John 15 to help describe this process of submitting to God's ways, it, it talks about allowing God to come in and to prune your life. This is a really big act of submission. It's allowing God to come in and cut back anything away that doesn't look like Jesus. So you have to submit to everything about your life, who you're connected with, what you're doing. You have to allow God to take away anything that doesn't look like Jesus. And both of these things, um, though different aspects of it, they're talking about the same thing. and uh, They're both describing this process that we would use uh, in the church. We'd use this term. It's called sanctification. And what is that? It's just a fancy word to describe exactly what we're talking about. Sanctification is becoming more like Jesus. Jesus. That's what John 15 is all about, right? It's God expects those, this is John 15, God expects those who follow Jesus to look more and more like Jesus from the inside out. And so how do you do that? And again, at the risk of sounding overly redundant this morning, first get connected to him, and second submit to the process by allowing God to come in and prune away anything that doesn't look like Jesus. So you understand this, salvation is this amazing wonderful gift that God gives to us. You know, through Jesus, we're told we are offered that restored relationship with God and everlasting life. And the Bible teaches that this amazing free gift is from God. It's something that you cannot achieve or that you cannot earn. And in fact, the Bible explicitly teaches, this is in Romans 10, 9, that all you have to do to get this gift is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the gospel message, that is, Jesus died and was raised again all for you. And the Bible teaches if you do that, you're saved. No questions about it. But here's the thing. God, he, he never intended you to receive salvation and then to simply stop. To sit back 
to end, to stay put, to stay right where you are. He desired more than that. He expects you to grow. And so last week at the end of the sermon, we, we watched a video together by the skit guys called God's Chisel. You can look it up on YouTube. It's phenomenal. Uh, and in the video, they, they had explained this so beautifully, but one of the lines they talk about, they, they say, you're never standing still. You're either moving away from God or towards God. So I want to make sure you understand that this morning. I want to make sure you hear this clearly. Don't buy into this lie. Don't believe that you can stay where you are. See, God expects you to work with him on becoming a little bit more like Jesus every day. And if you start to think about this process of becoming more like Jesus, uh, some people might talk about it about becoming holy, although we don't like to say that because we don't think we can really achieve that. Uh, but the Bible tells us we should, which we're going to get to in a minute. Or, you know, this idea of becoming sanctified, be, you know, going through the process of sanctification, becoming more like Jesus. As you think through the ramifications, you might sense a little tension. There's a little bit of tension because becoming more like Christ is this combined effort between you and God. And throughout history, people have generally fallen into two camps here. The first, uh, they're called quietism. So in quietism, the emphasis is all on God's role in this process. It excludes you from any responsibility or involvement as an individual. It's a very passive position to take. You, you simply sit back and say, if God wants me to change, if God wants me to grow, he'll do the work. You know, I can kind of see why it's an attractive uh, model. It requires nothing of you. But the Bible clearly doesn't teach that. And then if we jump all the way to the other end of the spectrum, you get pietism. Uh, so if quietism is very passive, pietism is very aggressive in its approach for moral purity. Uh, but this extreme approach often leads to self-righteousness and prideful spirits because any improvement seen in your life, you, you tell yourself, is wholly because of your efforts, and you should be commended for what you have done. And God loses out on the credit he rightfully deserves. So both of these miss the mark because they, they simply they fail to live in the tension that's really there in this process of becoming Christ-like, of becoming holy, in this process of sanctification. You see, there's tension there, and you can't do away with it. It's going to be there. Sometimes you have to learn to live in the tension. One of my favorite authors, Jerry Bridges, uh, he wrote it this way. He said, We can say accurately that the pursuit of holiness, that's what we're talking about, this pursuit of becoming more like Christ, is a joint venture between God and the Christian. No one can, no one can attain any degree of holiness without God working in his life. But just as surely, no one will attain it without any effort on his own part. God made it possible for us to walk in holiness, but he has given us the responsibility of doing the walking. He does not do that for us. Let's take a minute. Let me, let me read to you a passage from uh, Philippians 12, 13. This is a passage that uh, often will bring up a bit of confusion, and but I think it really does a good job of highlighting the tension uh, uh, in this process of becoming Christ-like. So listen to this passage, Philippians chapter 2, 12 to 13. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. So let's make sure we're understanding what's being said here. You are not being told, work for your salvation. We, we already talked about that. The Bible is very clear that this is not the case. So what is Paul saying? Because he's saying, work out your salvation. What, what, what he's saying, if he's not saying, work to get saved, what is he saying? It's essentially this. He's saying, now that you are saved, now that God has worked in you, now that God has saved you, start living like it. We're told to work out what God has already worked in. We are to live in such a way that shows that God has done his saving work in our lives. Uh, at some point, if you're familiar with the church at all, you've probably heard 
uh, salvation being described as born again. You know, we talk about being born again Christians. So if we want to follow that analogy a little, if salvation is being born again, then the point Paul is making here is that it is time for Christians to grow up. That's what this call to holiness, that's what the process of sanctification, that's what becoming Christ-like is all about. It is growing up spiritually. See, God's desire is not that you would only accept Christ as your Savior and simply stay an infant, stay a little bit of baby, but that you would, with his help, become more like Christ, that you would mature, that's why we use these terms, that you would mature in your Christian faith, that you would grow up. Uh, the word used here is it's a phenomenal word to say. It's katagazomai. It's a fun word. You want to try it? You ready? Katagazomai. Uh, that word, it's used in our Philippians passage that I just read, and we translate it as workout. So it says, continue to katagazomai your salvation. Continue to work out your salvation. And it's significant. The reason I'm bringing it up is because this word always deals with the concept of of seeing something through to the completion. It's really significant. The word always deals with seeing something completed. It's seeing it through all the way until it's completed. So what does that mean for you? What does that mean in the context of the passage? It's saying you are saved. You've accepted Christ. Now what? Paul says, work out what God has worked in until it reaches completion. That, that's, that is, see to it that each day... When you go to bed, you are more like Christ than when you woke up. See this through all the days of your life until one day in glory, you can see it brought to its full completion. I want to walk through the first 11 verses of Hebrews 12 with you and show you the different things that God has for you as you go on this lifelong journey of becoming Christ-like. So the first thing I want you to notice, you're going to see it right in the first verse of Hebrews 12, and I'm going to read it in a minute. I want you to notice this. The first thing is, God has a plan for you. Let me throw it up on the screen, and I'll show you. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So the, the first thing I want you to know is this, right? God has a plan for you. I already said that. Uh, what uh, you got to understand from this first verse is God is sovereign. God is in control. God, uh, in his wisdom, is it's far above ours. His way are not ours. We talked about that already. His thoughts are not ours. So you need to understand that, that in God's infinite wisdom and total control, he created you with a purpose. There is a race, we are told, that is marked out for you. For you specifically. Uh, in other places, Paul kind of describes our relationship to each other as the body of Christ. We together create a whole, but we are each uh, individually, uh, have individual functions. And so know what this is teaching right in the beginning, Hebrews 12, 1, that God has a race or he has a path that is specifically marked out for you. And you might be wondering, well, how do I find that path? I would say perhaps the best place to start is Romans 12, 2, which is one of my favorite verses. Uh, it's one of those verses I've had memorized for a long time. And it, it says exactly what we've been talking about this entire time. So this is what it says. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which means ask God to help you. Work with God. Again, live in that tension. Uh, to change your mind, to change your thinking, to change your your uh, view of how things work in the world. And the second half of the verse is really important. You can't stop there. It says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, when you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what's your job in all of this then? In being transformed and finding out God's will, that specific path, that way that's marked out for you. Hebrews 12 tells us this in verse 1, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles you. 
So listen, if you feel like you are trying to grow spiritually, you're trying to become more like Christ, and when you're on this journey, if it feels like there are weights attached to you, they're holding you down or holding you back, there are vines or, or cords that are trapping your feet, they're tangling you up, it's likely because there are. But there is a solution. If you want to run the race that God has marked out for you, ask him to come in and to prune your life, to prune away anything that doesn't belong. That's going back to John 15, right? If you ask him and you submit to his process, he will cut you free from the weights and the cords and the vines that are holding you back. Here's the second thing that God has for you. Ready? God has an example for you. We're going to read Hebrews 12, now continuing 2 to 4. Let me throw it up again. It says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So God has an example for you. Understand that this journey of becoming Christ-like, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, I ran a half marathon. It seems like a lifetime ago now. Um, it was back in 2011. And it was tough. I, I trained and I trained for it. And it was still tough the day that the race came. It was a cold Calgary morning. And, oh, I, I can tell you there are points where I wanted to quit. There are points when I wanted to give in. Uh, but I kept my eyes on the prize. And, and that's what this is all about, right? You might grow tired on this journey of growing spiritually. You might be in pain from it. There are certainly times when things are being pruned out of your life, and that's painful. Don't, don't misunderstand this process. This process of becoming like Christ is hard. Sometimes it is painful. But how, how then do you endure? How do you work through it? The, the answer is this. You keep your eyes on the prize. The passage here tells us in Hebrews 12, you keep your eyes on Jesus, who endured far worse than you, and he did it all for you. Let's keep going. The next thing God has for you, ready? God has an encouragement for you. This is a fun one. Hebrews 12, 5 to 7. Let me throw it up there. It says... And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as children? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a child. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true children at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of Spirits and live? Told you it's fun when it doesn't sound like encouragement, does it, when we're talking about discipline? But it really is. The passage is teaching us something that's so hard to see in the moment and so easy to see after it's already happened. And that is, if God is disciplining you, it should be a cause for rejoicing. But truthfully, most people, myself included, don't often uh, jump straight to rejoicing in the middle of discipline, in the middle of hardships you might be facing. But the truth is, when the discipline is done, when it's done not for punishment but out of love, it's 100% for your benefit. I know this well now as my son Lewis has exited the baby stage and he has quickly transitioned into a toddler. And dare I say it, and I say it with total love, a mischievous toddler. You know, it's not like we have a large list of rules for him, but we have some basic safety guidelines that we have to uh, enforce for him with some boundaries that we enforce. So for instance, he knows that he is not allowed to touch the electrical outlets. And again, we, we of course, let me 
put your mind at risk. We, of course, have the safety tabs in them and everything. But still, as a general rule, as a safety rule, as a guideline, uh, as a boundary, we don't let him touch them. And he knows this. He knows it so well. So what does he do? Uh, if he uh, feels like we're not paying enough attention to him, or he is just being mischievous, he will walk right over to an outlet. He will turn. He's going to look you in the eye. And then without breaking that eye contact, he's going to reach his hand out and touch it. He knows. I can tell you this much, though. Lewis does not enjoy timeouts. He does not enjoy the discipline. But as a parent, I can only hope that the discipline I instill in him now is going to help keep him safe. It's going to help him learn what's best for him. It's going to help him become a, a better person because of it. See, so understand, it's not about punishment. It's about love and protection and care. God's discipline is the same. It's not punishment. It's love. The fourth thing God has for you, uh, we're down to Hebrews uh, 10 to 11 now, Hebrews 12, 10 to 11. God has a harvest for you. Let me throw it up. Our parents disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our own for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That's, that's the key. See, discipline is never the end in itself. It is a process that if you will, are willing to be trained by it, if you're allowing God to come in and do it, it is a process that is going to lead you to becoming more like Jesus. See, God prunes and he shears us, and his pruning shears are an act of discipline. When he's cutting back anything in your life that doesn't look like Jesus, and those who allow God to do that, to come in, to prune their lives, to bring discipline in their life, we are told, are going to reap a harvest of righteousness and peace. This is the process. This is how you become Christ-like. It's not always going to be pleasant. We build up this lie that if you become a Christian, everything's going to be uh, rosy and easy and no hardships will come, but the Bible teaches something completely different. And as you become more like Christ, it means letting go of things that you used to define yourself by so that you can be more fully defined by Him. You have to let God loosen your attachments that you often hold on to so tight so that you can find your meaning in Him. It's not always going to be pleasant. It's going to be downright hard at times, and yes, even painful. But the harvest is what you are after. The end result is the goal. Do you want to become more like Christ? Then you have to get connected to Jesus by daily spending time in his word, by reading the Bible. But if you want those words uh, that you're reading, if you're going to them daily, if you want them to move beyond information that's passing through your brain and to begin to act in this process of transformation in your life, then you have to submit to the process and allow God to use the words from the Bible to prune your life, to prune everything out of your life that doesn't look like Jesus. So listen, I really want to be clear. Know that God has a plan for you. You're not just going this way and that. There is a specific plan and purpose for you. God has, uh, he wants to reveal it to you. And God set an example for you in this. You're not just blindly trying to do it uh, when life gets hard, he says, look to Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on him because he endured far worse and he did it for you. God wants you to be encouraged as you face hardships, as you face discipline. And he wants you to be prepared to reap the harvest of righteousness and peace that he's laid out before you. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so overwhelmed by your love. Lord, we pray you give us courage to submit to the process of becoming more like Jesus. 
in the middle of hardships, trials, when we're facing difficulties. Lord, help us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We pray, Lord, you would give us so much grace along this journey because there will be times when we ignore your way because our way seems to make more sense. When we use our wisdom because it seems to be better than yours. Lord, we are going to fail. But we pray that you would help us get back up. That you would help us rejoin you on this journey of daily becoming more like Jesus. That we would see this process through to its completion where we one day uh, enter glory. We thank you so much for your love, for your care, for your guidance, for the boundaries you set up for us. We pray, Lord, that you would keep us, and until we can meet again, we give this service and everything that's going on here uh, over to you. Would you receive it as a pleasing and honoring sound? So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. Uh, something we do here at the end of every service at Faith Community is called Take Two. This is where we take uh, two minutes to answer two questions. So the first question is simply this. What is one thing God is saying to you? This could be anything from the sermon, could be from any of the scripture passages we had, even from the song. Just ask God, what are you saying to me? And then take the other minute to ask the second question, which says, how do you want me to respond? What do you want me to do about it? Now that you've spoken to me, what would you like me to do? So I'm going to give two minutes. I'll put the timer up, and then I'll come back and close the service. But take two minutes to answer these two questions. Thank you for coming this morning. I hope uh, God has spoken to you. I hope that he's given you some action steps. I hope you are willing to join him on this lifelong journey of becoming more and more like Christ. I uh, want to remind you that the chat's going to remain open here for about the next uh, 30 minutes or so. I would love to connect with you. Um, we can talk about your take two if you're feeling bold and want to share that, or even just the weather or some sports are starting up. I'm happy just to have that connection with you. I'd love to, to stay around and chat. And let me remind you uh, that on Wednesday night at 6 p.m., we'll be right back here for worship and song. And uh, that's just an evening that we dedicate to praising God through song. And we just lift up our voices. I usually lead about a, a short 10-minute devotional, but it's mostly about lifting our praise up to God through song. Um, before you go, let me offer you a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Would you go with that peace this morning?